Um, welcome to the third day of the Subnet Summit series. Um, today we have Leo Shokrun with us, and Leo is at Ash, this company that is working to build open so an open source toolkit to empower Subnet owners, developers, and node operators. Uh, just as a bit of a background, um, Leo's company, after they worked five years as uh, data consultants, they created this company called e36 knots which is building ash to empower the web3 ecosystem with their five years of it infrastructure knowledge um, so today is, they're going to be discussing their first tool which is an ansible based um, avalanche uh, uh, repo um, which which leverages uh, ansible some of you know ansible is the de facto tool for it automation and it uh, it's going to be used to manage the entire node lifecycle in um, Avalanche validators. So, um, yeah, uh, well, welcome to the to the uh, the the, su the summit, sir. Thanks, Nathan. Thank, thanks for having us. Uh, as I said earlier, it's a it's a really cool event. Uh, I I watched uh, most most of the most of the event so far and got some great insights from it. So so thanks for thanks for hosting this and thanks for having us. Well, wonderful. Yeah, we're all building up to the Avalanche, uh, you know, Barcelona Summit. So we we give them a massive plug. If anyone would like to go, their tickets are still on sale. Although they're slowly decreasing. Um, so yeah, I'd I'd love to learn more about Ash and and see some of the demos and and learn about how your your infrastructure provides support for the ongoing, um, you know, subnetwork. Yeah. Okay. Um... So as you as you as you said in the beginning, um, yeah, some 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 agenda. I, I have a couple of slides, but uh, should not take us too long. And we most most of the of my of my time here will be spent uh, on the technical demo, which uh, which will showcase everything we can do with the with the Ansible Avalanche collection that that we built. So quickly about us, as as you said. Um, uh, our company is called E36 Knots. Uh, we have a background of uh, being a big data IT experts. Uh, we worked for most of uh, France's biggest company operating uh, big data clusters. Um, and we started growing, getting interest in Avalanche uh, about two years ago with a, with a colleague. Um, and so we decided to, to, to create our company and to build our first product, uh, which is called Ash. Um, which will be a, a set of toolkits around uh, to to empower users and developers around the the Avalanche ecosystem. Uh, okay, I think I skipped skipped the slide. Okay, so there's the mugshot uh, with lots of smiles and uh, <laughs> smiles and uh, great uh, great shirts. Uh, so this is me in the middle, and uh, these are my colleagues and co-founders, uh, Gucci and, uh, and Antoine. Um, so, as a as a little, for a little bit of context, we, um, as I said, we we started uh, getting interest in Avalanche about two years ago, and we went to the Avalanche Summit uh, last year. Uh, we participated uh, with my colleague Gauthier in the in the hackathon that was uh, that was organized there, and um, it was a fun experience. And at this time, uh, we we had some chats with the the other teams, and. Uh, we did notice that some the big the biggest pain point of the other teams were uh, around uh, deploying the deploying the Avalanche Go software, creating subnets. the The documentation from Avalabs at this point was, was not what it is today. They, they had some great improvement on this side, and uh, this is actually around this time that we started working on the what what I'm what I'm going to show you today, the the Ansible Avalanche collection. Um, so in terms of the, the subnet infrastructure problematics that we identified uh, during this hackathon, um, it started with the Avalabs tooling. So in case there are some guys from Avalabs watching us, this, this is absolutely not, not a diss. We, we, we love your tools. We love the tools. But uh, we did notice that um, uh, they are a little sparse. We, we have Avalanche Go, Avalanche Network Runner, Subnet CLI. Uh, there used to be the Avalanche CLI, Avalanche GS, which are both um, deprecated if, if i'm if i'm correct um we did find that these tools were um, a little bit hard to integrate with other solutions uh it's some light stuff like for example with the with the subnet cli uh, when when you create a local subnet uh, you have no other choice but to run local subnet 
that's running with the default Avalanche uh, network runner properties, like the default uh, the default ports, uh, the default properties for Avalanche Go, etc., which is a bit annoying. Um, also, the subnet CLI uh, you you cannot uh, exploit the output of the command in the in the JSON form, for example. It's you know, it's little things like this uh, that that got us bugged and made us want to bring something to the table. You know. Um, also, when it comes to, to, to the famous Avalanche Go installer.sh, with uh, most, if not everyone that uh, did deploy Avalanche Go at some point uh, had to use, um, we think that is great for getting started, but it does not scale well to having multiple nodes. Um, and also in the in the node as a service uh, ecosystem, um, we did find that most of the of the providers. Uh, I mean, they're great. They're doing a great job. We did try a bunch of them. Um, I watched the talk yesterday with uh, uh, with Nirvana Labs. What they're building is super cool. Uh, but we did notice that uh, most of these solutions they seem like software as a service black box. Like you don't really know much about what's going around you. You basically you put your credit card and you you get an avalanche uh, node spin up. Uh, you get an RPC so you can interact with it, but you don't really know what's happening. What's happening behind the behind the scene, and with these services, there's no possibility of self-hosting your nodes. Like uh, you, you cannot bring uh, bring your cloud, bring your cloud, or bring bring your machines. And also, some of these services have uh, a, a lack of in, of native integration with with Avalanche main feature. Uh, that's interesting here to, for us in the summit, which are which are subnets. And so, this is how we came up with uh, with the Ansible collection just, just to introduce sensible to the people that that don't know what it is um it's an open source it automation tool uh, which has been which has been developed by red hat actually it was bought by red hat a couple of years back um and it has become the the, the de facto tool to to automate system configuration and, and software deployment um our background as a big data engineer we we used ansible uh Almost daily, uh, because it was our job to to deploy uh, software on lots of, lots of machine in a reprodu reproducible and um, predictable fashion, which is exactly what Ansible does. And so we we thought that we could leverage Ansible capabilities to uh, to operate uh, Avalanche node clusters in a in a large scale uh, large scale way. And so we came up with the. Ansible Avalanche Collection, which is uh, which is open sourced, uh, you can you can check it on our on our GitHub. Um, actually, credits to my colleague Gauthier, which did the most of the most of the groundwork of everything that I'm going to show today. Uh, to today, we're working together on this, but he it, it, it did most of the early works. Um, this Ansible Avalanche Collection will allow us to deploy and configure a lot of stuff related to Avalanche. Uh, obviously, Avalanche Go. So with uh, with the collection, you can provision Avalanche nodes on Fuji, Mainnet, or even as a local cluster. Uh, the collection allows you to upgrade both uh, VMs and uh, Avalanche Go, which we'll be seeing in the in the demo next. Um, Ansible brings us easy node configuration, persistence, and idempotent deployment. This is really important because if I have some test infrastructure on Fuji and some production infrastructure on mainnet, I want to make sure that uh, both of them look the same and uh, Ansible is great for doing that. Um, with the collection, we can bootstrap local networks as we'll see next. Uh, and we also implemented uh, a bunch of cool features related to subnet. So it can be used to create subnet, create blockchain, and also some extra feature uh, like creating faucet, creating a block explorer that's connect directly connected to your subnet. And uh, more to come. Okay, now be... that is super cool. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, also, also a lot more features that that will be. Uh, so, so for later. folks who don't know, um, I'd love to dive in just the block explorer part. So, mm -hmm. when you're bootstrapping a new chain, um, there, it's you have to index everything, and you have to create your own customized indexer. So, the fact that you have a a out of the box block explorer. Is is super cool. I'd love to go into that uh, when, when you know whenever you like. Mm, yeah, but we we'll see that in the demo. Where act actually we, we we can go to the demo right now. Uh, so during the demo, what we're going to do, um, we're actually going to showcase uh, the 
the, the, the tutorials that we did for for website you you linked the, the documentation earlier uh, we're going to install a, a five nodes uh, avalanche cluster on virtual machines which, which will be running on on my computer for the for the sake of the demo and we'll do a bunch of stuff on this avalanche cluster uh, we can deploy a subnet to blockchain um, try to deploy a faucet and a block explorer and also see how the ansible collection can help us perform a avalanche go upgrade and of course, uh, answer questions. Feel free to interrupt Nathan at any time if you if you want to dig more on on, on something. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I encourage people listening on audio to to check out the broadcast on on YouTube. Yeah, this 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 is going to be hard to follow with audio only. Uh, so I will now share my screen. Take your screen. Uh, should be fine. Let me know if it works. Oops. You can see my screen properly. Or do I have to activate the share in this? Uh... Oh, I, I think I, I think I lost you, Nathan. Sorry, yeah, it worked before. Now we're tiled. Uh, you, we, we had your terminal before. Oh, sorry. Uh, do, I, do I have to do something on my side, or you just have you? to? You have to choose the right screen. You're still choosing your browser. Okay, there you go. All right, we're good. Okay. Um, so what I did before. Um, just before starting the the talk, is that I I did create a couple of virtual machines on my computer uh, mm -hmm. using uh, Also, you may want to uh, uh, zoom in a bit. Okay. There you go. Cool. Okay. Um, so I did use Vagrant to create some virtual machines on on my computer with VirtualBox. Uh, actually, I can open VirtualBox to show you how it looks like. I have five. Uh, Small virtual machines with a uh, thousand gigabyte of RAM um, running Ubuntu on my computer. Um, actually, yeah, just as an introduction, everything that I'm showing here is actually the, the docs uh, from our website, which we which are right here, ash.center slash docs. I'll show that. Um, everything is uh, all of the comments that I would be doing are actually uh, on the on our documentation, and so. Um, it, in this first part of the tutorial, uh, what I did before the call was creating the virtual machines. I did this before because it's a bit uh, a bit long and uh, not really interesting for uh, for our viewers. Um, so basically, now what we can do is uh, show what an Ansible inventory looks like. Um, I will zoom in a bit also. Tell me if the size is okay. I think I think it should be fine. So basically, what uh, what an Ansible inventory is, is just a list of nodes. Um, they could be VM, they could be a uh, bare metal machine, uh, they could also be Linux containers. Um, these nodes will be uh, reached via SSH with Ansible, and then Ansible will perform a bunch of stuff on these nodes. Uh, what Ansible performs is what we describe in the Ansible collection. Uh, for example, create a user, create the right directory, Upload an archive, extract the archive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what what we want to do in our inventory is uh, to define a group, an Ansible group, which will be where we will be installing uh, Avalanche using our collections. So in our case, the group has to be called Avalanche nodes. And here I'm going to be putting all of my five uh, local virtual machines. I nicknamed them from validator zero one to validator zero five. And all of this IP address will be resolving to virtual machines on my computer. Uh, in the case of this demo, we'll be running a local Avalanche uh, network, uh, not Fuji or uh, mainnet. So we have to we have an extra step in which we have to define a, a bootstrap node. And in our case, the bootstrap node will just be validator number one. Uh, again, all of this is described uh, in our in our documentation, with, which you which you can see right here. Uh, okay, so I'm good to go. I define, uh, I have in my inventory uh, my five VMs and I 
tell Ansible that uh, these VM are part of the Avalanche nodes group, uh, which will be targeted when I run the Avalanche playbook right now. OK, so this command is basically uh, I'm running an Ansible playbook, which is a series of action described in Ansible. And uh, I'm asking Ansible to run the Bootstrap Local Network playbook on the inventory slash local uh, inventory, which is the one that we just uh, seen right now. OK. And so there we go. Uh, now the magic happens. And everything that's needed uh, to deploy a Go on the machine is now being deployed on my virtual machines. OK, and these, yeah. just as a point of, these virtual machines each are 1,000 gigabytes on an external hard drive? They're running on, on my computer right now. Um, I can uh, I can open a new tab, uh, use Vagrant to SSH into one of the machine. But this, uh, but this machine you said right. has 1,000 gigs of um, storage? Uh, no, no, in the uh, RAM. It's, oh, just uh, RAM. Yeah, no, it's it's actually one gigabyte. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. There we go. My, my my bad. Yeah. There we, we can see it with the with the free command. Yeah. So, okay. Cool. Sorry. Sorry for sorry for the confusion. Um. Uh. So there I am inside my VM. Uh. The first one, validator zero one. And as you can see on the side, a bunch of stuff is happening. Um. I I will show you the 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 first steps and just to explain uh, what what's going on behind the scene. So the first thing that we'll do is create an Avalanche group and an Avalanche user, uh, which will be the one that will be running the Avalanche Go process on the virtual machine. Um, then we create a bunch of directories that will be used by Avalanche Go. Uh, in our case, we're deploying everything in this directory. I can navigate to it on the virtual machine and see everything that has been created. OK, so there I am in OPT, Avalanche, Avalanche Go. All of this is configurable, uh, of course. Um, there I can see that I have Avalanche Go uh, in version 1.9.16. Uh, this has been defined in this uh, YAML variable file. Uh, and all of this is configurable. So in my case, uh, I'm running Avalanche Go in this version uh, on a network ID that is local. Uh, this variable can also be uh, Fuji or mainnet, depending on what I want to run. Uh, for now, it, I'm not installing any VM, so no subnet VM for now, or spaces VM. And I'm not tracking any subnets. We're going to do that uh, just in a, in a second. And these are some variables that, are, that I have overridden, overridden sorry, for, uh, for, uh, for a node. Um, in our case, we have to adapt the Snow consensus protocol to a five node network, uh, so I did configure these two parameters. And so what's interesting is that from this uh, YAML variable file, uh, our Ansible collection will template the right configuration at the right place. Um, in our case, it's happening in etc avalanche avalanche go. Uh, in the config subdirectory, I can see my node.json uh, configuration file. And if I, yeah, let me open it with Vim. Um, for example, the two configuration that we just seen, uh, snow sample size and snow column size, uh, they have been added here as they as they should be, and all of the all of the other configuration have been templated uh, from the context of the of the run. So, for example, the HTTP host and port, uh, the port is coming from a variable, and the host is coming from the the IP address of my current machine. Uh, this is where I'll be storing my Avalanche Go database. Uh, if I have subchains, subchains configuration, they will be stored here, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think our first playbook ran uh, until the end. Um, so now I do have on my uh, computer uh, a five node local Avalanche cluster. So right now it's not doing much because I do not have created a subnet. I have not run any transaction, etc. So let's let's go ahead and, and try to do that. Um, first thing we're going to do before creating a subnet is installing the subnet EVM because out of the box, uh, we, we do not have it. So I will do this by simply. Uh... OK, so so before we go into EVM land, these mm -hmm. are these are basically blank subnet uh, uh, settings with no with no virtual machine set. Yeah, exactly. Right. This, this this is a this is a vanilla Avalanche Go deployment. 
with absolutely no virtual machine. And so right now, the only uh, the only networks that are running are the P, P chain, C chain, and X chain. Right. Okay. So for like to think about this this sort of stage here, you could also choose like hyper SDK, right? Rather than the, the subnet EVM. I could choose any, yeah, any any VM that 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 is compatible with Avalanche Go. Uh, okay, so we could use land. You know, we here's where we would insert the landslide core. Yeah, which is which is not EVM based; it's WASM based. Exactly. This, yeah. this, this is where you would put it. Um, or, I, I or, sure. or or for instance, Sparknet or or. Um, yep. And, yeah. And, any VM, we we yeah. did that we did that the uh, Spaces VM and Blob VM at some point in the tutorial, uh, but we removed them recently because they were not really kept up to date by uh, right. by right. the developers team. Cool. Uh, so in our case, we'll be wanting to deploy uh, Sunday TVM in the version uh, 0.4.12, which I think is the latest compatible with this version of Avalanche Go. Uh, we actually do keep a, a, a matri uh, compatibility matrix of every uh, known VM for now. So basically just some native VM and as I said, blob VM, etc. Uh, but we definitely at some point will uh, implement the, the you guys is your 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 VM and uh, in, implement it in the in the collection. Yeah, definitely. So I just added this variable uh, from an NT array to this list. And by re Re relaunching the provision playbook, uh, we will see that the VM will be downloaded and installed at the right place on all of my uh, virtual machines. So actually, the playbook that I will run now is provision node, uh, which is just rerunning the, the configuration. So most of these actually is OK, because Ansible, as it's uh, idempotent, uh, it does not have to run something that's already uh, in, the, in the state that we want. Uh, for example, as I, as I said earlier, we create a bunch of directories, like for example, the, the database directory, etc. All of these are already created because I ran this playbook before, so it, it says OK instead of change. What should be changed, though, is the uh, plugins directory. Uh, there we are. Uh, oops, I skipped it. Sorry, it's a bit big. I'm having trouble to find what I want. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, at this point, what is changed here is that we create a new directory to upload our subnet VM. We download the binary of the subnet VM in the version that we targeted, and it's being put at the right place in the in the Avalanche Go. So if I go back to my uh, Avalanche Go directory installation, I can see that I have a new directory that's been created, which is called VMs. And in this VM, I will have a list of the VMs that I want deployed by the Avalanche Ansible collection. In our case, we do have the subnet EVM in the version we want, and there's the binary. Also, what's uh, interesting to note is that um, the, the collection automatically detected that something changed in the configuration. In our case, we added a VM. So it knows that it has to restart Avalanche Go in order to uh, load this VM and take into account uh, the, the, the new configuration that I just did. So Avalanche Go has been restarted. The VM has been read and is ready to be used in a in a, in a subnet and and blockchains. Okay, cool. so now that I do have uh, my VM ready to go, uh, let's go ahead and deploy. A, try to create a subnet. So as a, just as a warning, uh, for now, how how we implemented the the, the subnet creation. Uh, we did use the key store API, which has been marked as deprecated in a couple of versions ago. Um, so this is uh, this is pretty. How can I say? Maybe dangerous to use in production because it's uh, from the beginning in the documentation. Avalabs uh, recommended not to use this in production, and since it has been deprecated, it will it will probably be gone in a further release. Uh, so we do have some work to do to re-implement those in proper uh, transaction signing and validation. So in order to create a subnet, I do have to create some control keys, which is actually done by this curl request. This is just a basic request on the pchain endpoint of my local cluster. Um, and the payload is this. Uh, we do create some control keys for the user ewok, which is a 
which should be familiar to those that have uh, already went through the, the Avalanche documentation. So I will just run this. Well, let me close this one so we can see better. I will run this here. Uh, if I try to, I saved uh, the two control keys in environment variables. So it should be Q, uh, dollar key one should be fine. Yeah, and key two. Okay, there, there are my two control keys. Um, next step is to run Sorry, just, the... just as a yep. point, uh, describe the importance of those keys and where they should be stored. Um, well, those keys are the ones that are used to, uh, for example, whitelist uh, validators inside the subnet. Um, so they are pretty important. And um, they should be stored. Uh, not sure what you mean here, but <laughs> I, I don't know, like the most secure way possible. I mean, not in this particular demo, but let's say you're, you're doing this in production. Where do you recommend storing those keys? Um, like sure. dash lane, like some like. Uh, oh, in this, yeah, like most mo most secure stuff. What, what we what we use on our side is um, uh, we use a tool called Pass, which is a GPG encrypted uh, password manager. Uh, you can also put them on a ledger, I guess. But thing is, is keep keep those secure. Okay, so just just as a just describe the function of those keys once more. The the the, the of the control keys. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they they are the ones that uh, prove that you are the subnet owner. Right. And um, I, as I said, I think they are used to 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 whitelist validators. If I'm, yep. if I'm correct. So this, if 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 these keys leak, that means you'll have potentially malicious validators joining the joining the subnet. Um, okay, so we do have a control keys. Let's keep going and create our subnet. Um, in the case of this command, I'm just overriding some variables to 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 load the the control keys that I just created. Again, using this uh, using the key store API is not really recommended, but for the sake of um, of the demo and local development, it's uh, it's okay. Just as a one, one, one final thought about the private key management, I, I suspect that at some point institutions will want to have those keys generated by a custodian, someone like an MPC provider like Fireblocks or uh, Bitco or someone, because mm -hmm. they don't they need to have the, the keys kind of insured and managed. That's probably where that will go. Yeah, I. I guess I've, I haven't really thought much about this, but um, yeah, it's definitely something to to something to be weary, weary of as a as a subnet owner. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's like basically the keys to your house. Mm, yeah. Um, okay, so my playbook here did nothing because I forgot something. Uh, I forgot to add a subnet control node to my Ansible inventory. Um, what will this be doing? Is just we give a we give Ansible a target because uh, most most of the subnet creation step uh, create the are uh, reaching to an RPC uh, node, and we have to define which RPC we want to to join in our case. So let's just add one and, and put validate one. Uh, I will also add another Ansible group. Uh, in this case, it's the validators that will be validating my subnet. So I'm creating a subnet that's not validated by all of my uh, local cluster only validates one to one to entry in this case. Do you need to have a prime number? Uh, no, this, this is actually just uh, in terms of Ansible uh, host building, uh, inventory building, this is just like an alias. Hmm. It could be, it could be anything. I will go ahead and uh, read. I mean, like, can you, can you run of a, a subnet with with an even number of validators does it matter? um i think we can yeah if the if 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 the if there's no consensus well in 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 case of um of a local cluster like like we have here if if, if there's no consensus parameters are well set i i think there should be an issue in running an even even numbered subnet 
Uh, okay, the playbook went through the end, and uh, our subnet was created. Yes. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's cool. So that means we have a Genesis file. Um, not yet. This is actually the next step. Um, okay, so we have the subnet ID. We just have the subnet ID for now, and the as as we can see here, the collection is reminding us that the subnet ID has to be on the track subnet list of our validators in order to be validated. Because uh, if I go a little bit earlier, so at this point, uh, the subnet was created, and we added the validators to the subnet. But for now, the validators have not been the Avalanche Go has not been have not been told to validate the subnet. So we do have to go ahead and add this to the configuration. I will showcase it in in another another window. I can SSH, uh, for example, on my validator tree uh, and go check out its Avalanche Go configuration. Node.json. For now, it's not tracking any subnet because this variable is empty. So to, what I'm going to do here is just get the subnet ID that has been created and uh, add here, as I did for the Avalanche VMs, just a new subnet. Is basically the idea of the of the subnet that has, that has just been created. I will go ahead and rerun the provisioned playbook. Again, all of this is already good in good state, so all of this is okay. The only change that we should see here is the the templating of the not configuration, which should be changed because we are now tracking subnets. Yeah, there we've seen it. Let me show you. It's this one, this part. Okay, we went to, to the end. If I go ahead and get my configuration file, I can see that my subnet is now being tracked with the right variable. And uh, Avalanche Go has been restarted on this node because we are uh, because the configuration changed. Um, so now my subnet is created. I have three validators inside the subnet and all of these uh, validators Avalanche Go know that they have to track the subnet. Uh, so let's go ahead and create a blockchain then. Um, actually, I can just go to our documentation. In this case, I will have to override another variable because uh, Ansible at this point, because we don't have a state, uh, Ansible does not know about my uh, my uh, my subnet ID. So I, I will have to give it to him through this uh, through this variable. Up, uh... I will close this. In our case, the subnet ID is the one that I just tracked here. Oh. I, wanted, I wanted to highlight a, a comment here. Mm -hmm. um, th this guy on uh, Luis Frima said, looks easier to add a validator than finding 2000 AVAX. <laughs> it is. <laughs> It is, and especially in our case, because we're on a, we're on a local local uh, network, so everything is uh, everything is free for us. Um, okay, so in this case, let's go ahead and create a blockchain. Uh, you were talking about the Genesis file. Um, in this case, we have a pretty vanilla Genesis file, uh, which I can show to you. It's inside the collection, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, there it is. Would you just increase uh, the size a little bit on that? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, yeah there we go. Great. So this 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 is the all of the default variables that Ansible will use uh, in the blockchain creation um, playbook. And so, as I've not overridden anything, this will be the the variable the data that will be used. As I said, it's a pretty basic uh, Genesis file. I think we just copy. The one from the Avalanche documentation. Okay, so um, uh, for those who don't know, would you explain how you want to start token, uh, maybe account balances here? Um, it's actually this variable. Um, this is the inside this variable. We can put some pre. We we can instantiate the the blockchain with uh, some tokens allocated to given addresses. This particular address is the Ewok address, as they nickname, nickname it at Avalabs. And uh, this value is really high. I don't really remember how many tokens that is. 
Um, but for development purpose, if I did want to spin up um, another blockchain based on the subnet EVM with multiple uh, addresses uh, having balance, I could just uh, go ahead here and write some other uh, other addresses with some value, and my my blockchain would be created with the uh, with the the right uh, balance for each of the users that would be here. Right. So so uh, just just as a, a point of clarification, what what is the Ewok address? Uh, the Ewok address is the um, it's actually uh, it's actually this one. It's the it's the one they 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 do use in the in the documentation uh, as an example uh, because they provide both its public and, and private key obviously um, and I think the private key in the base uh, fifty eight uh, format begins with Ewok this this is why they 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 name it like this okay so it's a fully doxed address yeah. basically right yeah, yeah it's 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 everywhere in the in the Avalabs documentation. Um... Would you clarify, so like um, token balances, so initial token balances, what determines those are a, a set of like, let's say early investors, a set of white lists, uh, incentivized testnet participants. What, what else determines those initial token balances? Could, could be anything. If, if you, um, for example, say you want to create a, a, a permission blockchain with only a, uh, a dozen addresses that are allowed to uh, interact with smart contracts you could create your your blockchain with a with an allocation of uh, for for all these 10 addresses and 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 make it so that your that uh, that only this address can interact with the contract uh, as you said it can be some uh, some investors that that will be having token in the in this in instantiation of the blockchain um don't yeah the the, the all other cases with could could be anything i mean like yeah. great thank you uh did our blockchain creation went to the end it did uh and so at the end of the of the playbook that i just launched uh, the collection is showing us the actual id of the blockchain this id is going to be useful to us because this is also the the rpc endpoint uh, of our subnet evm in our case, it's this one that I'm going to save. Um, I think I can then go ahead and try to create a, a faucet for this blockchain, which is going to be useful in, in terms of uh, development, local development. Uh, let me close this file. It's not needed anymore. Those you don't know, faucets are where you get test tokens. Yeah. Um, Again, I'm just going to add another node to my inventory, in this case for sets, and I will put it on validator 01. So just to be clear, I'm um, in this case, I'm using I'm reusing uh, one of the nodes that I already have as a faucet, but I could totally decide to have another node in my uh, in my Ansible host, which will be, I don't know, MISC, uh, MISC 01, etc. And this node could host all of the stuff that's not directly related to Avalanche Go, like my faucet and uh, my blockchain explorer, for example, which is going to see next. But in this case, uh, let's keep it easy and use validator one as a faucet. Um, I do have a special configuration file for the faucet, uh, which is uh, which is this one. Yeah, I, I did not tell this, but the, the faucet is actually um, deployed based on the one that's been open sourced by Avalabs. Uh, so we just use this one and uh, added some some configuration that that I'm going to show you. Um, I do have to replace this RPC with the actual one that has been created for my blockchain, and I should be good to go. Uh, let's customize team here uh, and give our special blockchain uh, our subnet a, a nickname. It's going to be yours, Nathan. Nathan subnet. And uh, let's say the native token of my subnet is called the uh, summit. OK, I'm good to go. And I will just run the faucet playbook. Um, 
yeah i think it's good let's go this one is going to take a little longer than the others because uh to keep things simple we are using uh, docker to uh to 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 create the faucet instance and to launch it so before actually configuring the faucet and starting it we do have to install docker on the virtual machine and then we do have to pull the the avalanche faucet uh, docker image which takes a bit of time so maybe if we have if you have questions of remote, oh i've got some, right some questions <laughs> Okay, so just as a, um, I am a very defensive minded person. So if you go back and listen to the Dispel interview I did yesterday with, with Ian Schmertzler, Dispel provides moving target defense for like water systems, like municipal water systems, like Fortune 500 companies. And so if, if you're a paranoid person, um, I suggest going back to that. The reason I'm bringing this up is because um, is, is those P chain addresses that manage the validator set. That's like, those are, that's the central point of failure here. And I just bring that up because if, if, if people listen back to this, because it's going to be on YouTube or wherever that they'll be able to know where that back door is. And so the, the responsibility that we have here is to, is to say, this is, this is the danger point is that if you leak your keys to that, to that validator set, everything will go haywire. Mm. Um, so um, I encourage people to, to, you know, to, if you don't know how to manage those keys, reach out to someone who does like, yeah, I'm sure the team Leo and, and, um, and Ash can help you manage those keys. Um, you, if, you know, if you're an institution, you're, you're probably not listening to this, to this but if you are <laughs> listening to this, you have your own team that, that will talk to you about how to manage those keys. Um, I suspect that like from, you know, the perspective of Ash, I think you should, you guys should contact copper. Um, these guys do multi-party compute key sharding specifically for that. Mm -hmm. And you just basically, um, uh, you, 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 you form a, an API with that service so that those keys are managed by a multi-party compute system rather than, you know, your desktop. Yeah, this is a really good point, and we 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 talked about this earlier between us, and we were pretty sure that we'll have to integrate with some yep. some of these guys at at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dispel would be happy to help provide that type of moving target defense system. So, like what what we did when we've deployed smart contracts in the past, we set up a, a virtual machine, like a basically a, a secure moving target uh, network. We set mm -hmm. that up. And we deploy all of these uh, uh, um, contracts and all of the uh, repos in that safe VM, and then we store that key in a, a you know a, a new generated wallet, and, and that's how we store it. That's yeah. so that's a, a pretty reasonably secure method to to manage those keys. Yeah. Um, the other piece I wanted to bring up was uh, I would love to do this from within Chat GPT. <laughs> Um, I actually never tried, uh, I, I did use ChatGPT to, to debug some, some Ansible stuff for me. If you have a plugin to like, if I would, I would say that if you guys want a ton of users to set up SunNet, mm -hmm. that's how you do it. You set up a plugin basically through like a, a, a there's a, there's a couple tutorials out there, but yeah. you would, yeah, that's, that's the way to bootstrap these users. Okay. That. I haven't thought of it that way, but we <laughs> we definitely check check to see if we can do that. Um, so okay, so as we were discussing, that I, I think our faucet got spin up. So let's try to see if it's working. Um, faucet should be running on the validator one node. So Just uh, the increase the font on this one a little bit. Oh yeah, sorry. This is actually the docs. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's much and fun. there's my faucet. Okay. So we can see that the the configuration of array that I did put uh, was was applied correctly. Um, before requesting uh, some tokens from this faucet, I will just add the actually add our blockchain, our RPC uh, of the subnet inside my MetaMask. Um, I think that was when I did it before. I will just replace it. Ethereum. Networks. 
Well, let, let me do it in the expanded view so we can see better what I'm doing. Just copy and paste the RPC of the blockchain that we created. And configure it inside MetaMask. Network. Uh, so that was my previous. I'm just going to be deleting this one and add a new network. Uh, so we say that this was Nathan's subnet. That's the RPC and the chain ID, I believe, is 13213. Okay. And we say that our token symbol was summit. So this is not really useful because it's just for showing in MetaMask. Right on. Uh, okay, so we added the network. And uh, I can see that I currently have zero submit. I will try to airdrop some for me using the faucet. Um, so yeah, we were discussing about the the the, the eWalk address that comes prefounded uh, in our case. This is actually also the same address that we use as the faucet balance. Uh, so this is why the faucet has plenty of submits to to be distributed. Um, did I pick? Yeah, I. This is my address. I will airdrop me to submit. Transaction went through, and I should be seeing my tokens pretty soon. OK, here they are. Nice. So the faucet work. And as the faucet did perform a transaction, we're pretty confident that our uh, subnet is running properly. Uh, so last step here, we want to have what we discussed in the beginning is the block explorer. So in the same fashion, uh, we implemented the Block Explorer as a Docker service. Uh, in our case, this is Block Scout. So basically, the only uh, variable I have to override, again, is the, is the RPC endpoint. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy blockchain ID from here. Okay. Uh, so the RPC, again, is just the IP address of the virtual machine. And the blockchain AZ is the one that we created together. And this will be the final uh, playbook that I run. Uh, Block Scout Docker, it's this one. Oh, OK. So again, it did nothing because I did not uh, specify to Ansible on which target it should install Block Scout. Again, we'll keep things simple and deploy Block Scout to the validator 01. I miss indexes that. Sorry? The Block Scout indexes. Um, the Block, Block Scout is actually the name of the of the Ansible group uh, that Ansible will be targeting to run to deploy Block Scout. So this this is an arbitrary name that we choose because we are using Block Scout as a block indexer. Yeah. Okay. So we did look so at we did look at some other open source uh, block explorer. I don't remember the name. Uh, but yeah, in, in the end, Block Scout was was working better for us in in terms of uh, integration with uh, with some native VM. Okay, should be up in a couple of time. Actually, in the meantime, I did not show you this, but what I can do is. Go back inside the VM and show you that um, okay, Block Scout has just been started, and actually uh, the faucet is this one is running as a as a Docker service, and so is the the, the Block Scout service. Congrats, you did it. Uh, Let's see if we can access it. Yep, there we go. Uh, yeah. So what what I just did was actually um, I I pre-configured the faucet uh, so that it knows about our block explorer. So this is actually the transaction from the from when I requested the two submit token into my address. So if I click here, uh, this is the block scout that's running locally and configured on our subnet EVM blockchain. So we can see that uh, there it is. 
or to or to send the transaction from the faucet address, which is again the ewok address, to this uh, dev address that I created for this for this talk, and uh, we can also oh, what happened? Okay, demo demo effect obviously. <laughs> so this is the yeah. Just increase the font size a little. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, there you go. Oh, this is good. It gets a little bit messed up in terms of CSS, but. I think we get the case. So for now, I only have one transaction. Maybe I can try to perform an internal transaction uh, to see if I can see it indexed. Uh, actually, we just send back these two tokens uh, to the ewok address. Well, not the two, because then because of gas, I will not have enough. So I will just send back one submit token to the to the uh, to the faucet address. Right on. We've got a, we've got about five more minutes. Are there questions from the the viewers either on Twitter or YouTube? Just if you're on Twitter, throw up a hand. If you're on YouTube, just put it in the chat. Yeah, maybe, maybe as um b before we close um so again, every all of this is uh, open sourced and on our uh, on our GitHub. All of the documentation is on our website. Um, but one question that people might have is why we are doing all this? Because all of this is open source and free to use, so uh, not much money. <laughs> That's what I mean, I had that question myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this this was actually our our, our last slide. I, I will just stop sharing my screen and go back to the slides. Uh, if I'll I get can. the slides for you. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're trying to build with this is uh, actually what we call the the Ash console. Uh, to sum it up, is we, we, we just want to make some nets more accessible and decentralized for, for everybody. Um, and so we are building this enterprise grade toolkit to develop some net and operate challenge nodes. So what we'll be doing is um, based on everything, all, all of the all of all of what I, I I just showed you today is already open source, and we're trying to build uh, some kind of web UI so to um, that's built on it to to allow developers and well subnet developers and avalanche node operators to have more control in their infrastructure um, and having some kind of production ready tool yeah as, as it's been said in the in the comments so this is what we are trying to build for now awesome um just as a a, a point where does ash where does ash turn on the the money machine well we'll we'll have some as i said we'll have some maybe we can say like a SaaS web ui uh, which will ease everything that we've seen because um we are familiar with Ansible and CLI and commands, but we know that people want some shiny web UI uh, and buttons to click on. Uh, so, I want so the they... GPT version. I don't want <laughs> and, the, and the GPT <laughs> version. <laughs> so basically, what we'll be selling is the the, the, the web interface to 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 manage what we've seen in a, in a much more um, uh, user friendly way, if I can say. Right on. And some premium features as well, like uh, automatic node upgrade every every time Avalanche releases a new Avalanche releases a new Avalanche Go version. Uh, some advanced monitoring using uh, Grafana and Prometheus. Uh, we have a bunch of premium features that uh, that will not be uh, entirely open source and that we hope to be to be sending as uh, as premium plans and and of course support on all of what we're building. Well, happy, happy to have you. This was great. Um, as you know, uh, it, it's it's super cool to see this all happen in under an hour. Um, you know, that is the like the five minute hello world. Let's see if we can bring it down to a <laughs> to, to yeah. a five minute hello GPT. Here's my subnet. Um, <laughs> but this has been great, thank, uh, 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 Leo. Thank you so much for your time. I I I'd, I'd love to schedule another uh, session with Ash where we can do a like a, a five minute install, see if we can get it down there. Sure, um, yeah. Anyone can reach out to you on Twitter. Why don't you uh, give me your Twitter and I'll yeah, post it here. This is the this is the latest slide. We we do Great. have some a Twitter and we just set up a Discord. If you if anyone has uh, 
you know trouble or want to get help getting started with the Ansible collection, feel free to reach out to us, whether it's on issues with GitHub or, or on our Discord or, or even on Twitter. We are, we are All right. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having us. And yes. uh, have a nice good day of sessions. Cheers. See you.